This question dates back to June 2004, and we're going to get three little scenarios to deal with and see if we can identify the issues using what we've just learned. So, here we go with a question called Hawk Associates from June 2004. As always, let's start off by going and having a look at the requirements before we read any more detail. So, the question says, comment on the suitability of each of the above proposals in terms of the ethical and other professional issues that they raise. So ethical and other professional issues. Professional issues could, to be honest, involve virtually anything. So anything you think is an issue is worth mentioning. There are three stories to deal with. They total 15 marks. And as always with this exam, in general, you're looking to say one thing for one mark. So, all seems fairly straightforward. Let's go and see what these stories say. You are a training manager in Hawk Associates, a firm of chartered certified accountants. The firm has suffered a reduction in fee income due to increasing restrictions on the provision of non-audit services to audit clients. The following proposals for obtaining professional work are to be discussed at a forthcoming in-house seminar. So, your firm has suffered a reduction in income, revenue, and is looking for ways to increase that by getting some new clients. And three ideas have been suggested. And we've got to identify the issues with those ideas. Well, if you're looking to win new clients, we are presumably going to be looking at things like tendering, maybe, the use of advertising, and maybe the setting of fees as well. So, let's go and have a look. A. Now, the first thing I note about A is it's worth five marks, but it's only a single sentence. And I've got to get five ideas out of this. Given that it's so short, let's make a point of reading it very slowly, and wherever we can identify a word or a phrase which we think we can say something about, let's just stop and think because we may have to break this sentence up in order to get five marks out of it. Cold calling. Well, as it says in the brackets, cold calling is where you contact a company, a potential client, to try to sell them something. It's cold because there's no warmth there yet because you've never spoken to them before. It's almost like going through the phone book and just picking out a random phone number. So... What type of companies would you associate cold calling with? Is this, in fact, an ethical issue at all? Or is it perfectly acceptable? So who phones you up and tries to sell you things? Mobile phone companies? Holiday companies? Insurance companies? People selling windows and doors for your house? Don't remember any firms of accountants ringing me up. Or lawyers, or architects, or the other sort of professionals who presumably we as accountants would like to be associated with. And that's making me a bit nervous. I'm not sure I want to be associated with mobile phone salesmen, with uh, all apologies to mobile phone salesmen. So I'm not sure cold calling would be seen as professional. In fact, most people see it as hassling people. So that's something we can mention in our answer, that cold calling whilst I'm not aware of it being banned, although in some countries maybe it is, is probably allowable, but something we'd prefer that accountants didn't do because it lowers the reputation of the accountancy industry. Well, that's something we can say at least, but let's read on and see what else is in here. So, cold calling the chief executive officers of local businesses and offering them free... Well, free is to do with pricing. Free is very low pricing, obviously. Uh, when I think of low pricing, I think of low-balling. And free is about as low-balling as you can get. You're basically now rolling the ball along the ground, aren't you? It's so low. Well, we know what the issues are with low-balling. Can you go all the way and offer your services for nothing? Well, they're your services and it's your time. I presume if you want to do it for free, you can do it for free. 
But again, I now think about the issues with lowballing. That doing something on the cheap may make it look cheap. Okay, what else does it say? Free second opinions. What's a second opinion? Well, if you go to a doctor because you feel ill, and the doctor says they can't see anything wrong with you, you might choose to go to another doctor and get a second opinion. Or in other words, you're not happy with the first opinion, you're basically criticising it, and seeing if someone else thinks something else. So, if you're going to give a second opinion to a company, presumably what we're talking about here is phoning them up, asking them what their current advisors tell them, and then telling them something else. Well, if you're going to start telling non-clients opinions, and they've already got advisors, surely what you're doing is criticising the existing advisor for their opinion. And another thing, if you're going to give an opinion to someone, there must be a bit of a danger that if you don't know all the facts, you're going to give the wrong opinion. Hmm. Let's just go back to that doctor analogy. If you were on holiday and you went to a doctor's surgery because you felt unwell, they wouldn't prescribe any drugs to you without surely trying to contact your existing doctor first to find out the full story of your medical history. Otherwise, they might prescribe you something that could kill you, of course. So I'm guessing that if a company came to me and said, I'm not happy with my auditors or tax advisors, will you give me an opinion? I would probably want to go back to their current advisors and talk to them first partly out of professional courtesy, and partly to find out all the information I currently don't have. But in this situation, it's your firm who are going to someone else's client. Are you seriously going to go to them and then ring up their current advisor and say, hello, I'm trying to steal your client. Please tell me everything about them. Because my guess is the phone will be slammed down on you. Looking at this first one, it does not seem very appropriate. Cold calling appears to be unprofessional and has a bad reputation. Doing work for free is acceptable as long as you fully explain to the company why it's free, that you're doing them a, a discount to try and win them. But again, we'd rather lowballing didn't happen because it gives the impression that what's being given for free is not of much value. And thirdly, second opinions are an inherent criticism of the first opinion. And they also suffer the danger that you don't know all the information to give a proper opinion. So having broken this first one down into sort of three separate things, cold calling, free, like lowballing, and second opinions, I think I could say five different things about it. So let's now plan out an answer. Now please note, this is not what I would actually write in the exam. That has to be sentences, fully explained. Sometimes when I do questions, I'll do that in full, and sometimes we'll just do a plan, just so we can come up with the ideas. So, I'm looking to say around about five things. Firstly, cold calling.
So there's a few points about cold calling, as I mentioned. Notice the last point. Do you really think people pick their professional advisors based on random phone calls? I'm not convinced this is going to work unless you're incredibly lucky and happen to talk to a chief executive just at the point that he or she was sitting there thinking, hmm, really must get some tax advice. Can't see it working. Overall, therefore, I think the first suggestion is probably something that our firm should say no to. Well, I seem to have decided this first one's not going to happen, but I've still got to talk about free and second opinions. So let's consider those. Giving free advice is probably something that most professionals do from time to time as sort of part of the service, if you like. To do it to a non-client in the hope that it impresses them is maybe acceptable. I think of everything I'm reading in this first question, it's probably the most acceptable. Finally, second opinions. Second opinions are very dangerous. They should be issued with all sorts of disclaimers, such as, I can't give you a proper opinion until I've seen all the information. Such as, I probably can't give a proper opinion until I've actually spoken to your current advisors. And realistically, given what you're trying to do here, it would be very, very difficult to do this in an accurate and professional way. Now, I think this first one should be rejected just because of cold calling. But the second opinions, to me, makes it an absolute guaranteed non-starter. So, your firm's looking to raise revenues and the first suggestion hasn't got very far. Let's now take a look at the second one and see what we can find in there. Now, this one's worth six marks, but at least it looks a little bit longer. We must still have this very regimented approach of breaking it down and reading it slowly because if we read the whole thing through, there's a danger we can only think of one thing to say. So let's break it down and see what's in this one. 
Placing an advertisement in a national accountancy magazine. Well, before we look at what the advert would actually say, is an advert in a national accountancy magazine an appropriate way to market our firm? Well, we're a firm of accountants. Many finance directors would also be accountants and therefore, hopefully, would be reading this magazine. So, it seems like a sensible place to do it. I think the first point in my answer would be to say, placing the advert in this magazine is sensible. So there's one point we can make. Now let's see what the advert says. If you have an asset on which a large chargeable gain is expected to arise when you dispose of it, you should be interested in the best tax planning advice. Sensible words. In fact, when you're doing anything, you should be interested in the best advice. So that's just common sense, surely. We can't criticise that, can we? Well, yes, we can. Don't forget, this is not a textbook, this is an advert. So by saying you want the best advice in an advert, surely the heavy hint that they're trying to give is that this firm, Hawke Associates, give the best tax advice. And you can't say things like that unless you were voted best tax advisors of the year. And I can't see any indication on here that that's what you're saying. So you cannot simply claim to be the best, which effectively is what they're doing here. So that's another point for my answer. However your gains might arise, there are techniques you can apply. Well, techniques lacks a certain clarity, although I suppose in a short advert you can't really explain complicated tax techniques. But there's another issue with this I have a problem with as well. However your gains might arise, there are techniques. Well, however means in every situation. And whilst I was never the greatest student of tax in the world, I do seem to remember some situations where there are no techniques. That is your gain, that is the tax rate, that is the tax. So I'm slightly suspicious that that sentence is actually exaggerating the true position by claiming there are always tricks you can do when in fact sometimes there are no tricks. It's a bit like answering exam questions. I have tips for you in some situations, and in others, just do what the question says. So I think that that sentence is both an exaggeration and also lacks clarity. I'm also slightly concerned by the use of the word techniques. Are they saying that they can do things even if other tax people can't? Is there a slight hint here that they might do something unethical to reduce your tax bill? Or maybe I'm being unfair. Hmm. Let's read on. Hawke Associates can ensure that you consider all the alternative fact presentations. Alternative fact presentations. What on earth are those? Well, I know what a fact is. Uh, one plus one equals two. That's a fact. So what are they saying? Alternative fact presentation. Do they mean presenting an alternative fact? One plus one isn't two. One plus one is five. Well, that's lying, isn't it? Or are they saying, instead of saying one plus one equals two, let's present that a different way. Two minus one is one. Well, that's okay, isn't it? It's still the same information, just being given in a different way. Or is it? With maths, it's okay. But in other situations, hmm. Let me tell you a story. At my college in the first half of 2008, so that's the June 2008 ACCA sitting, not a single one of our P4 students failed. None of them. No failures. At all. Now that is a fact. However, what I haven't told you is we didn't have any students who sat P4. They chose the other three option papers instead. No one failed, but then nobody passed either, because no one sat it. I've just presented a true situation in a manner that makes me look good. Is there a danger that the tax authorities would not be happy 
if information is presented that is true, but designed maybe to suggest things that aren't true? Hmm. I think that there is a hint of wrongdoing in there, that this firm ha know how to make things look good when in fact they're bad. And whilst on occasion that may be acceptable, I'm wondering if in some situations it might be illegal or at best unethical. Hawke Associates can ensure that you consider all the alternative fact presentations so that you minimise the amount of tax you might have to pay. No tax saving, no fee. Well, that's contingency fees, isn't it? And we know what the ACCA's view on those is. So, we have the final few words indicate contingency fees, so we can talk about those. We have techniques. We have the word best. We have the alternative fact presentations and the fact that it suggests hmm, dodginess, shall we say. Oh, and don't forget, we have the National Accountancy magazine thing, which is actually a good point. So by breaking that down, we've actually got quite a few separate things to talk about. And for six marks, one comment for each of those, and we're going to get pretty close. So again, let me just note down what I've said up on the screen. Okay, so that's the second one, down as an answer plan. Turn all of those into sentences, remembering always to explain why you're making the point. And that one doesn't seem too bad, because there's quite a lot to talk about. But as with the first one, note how I went through it fairly slowly, picking out individual things to talk about. Don't read the whole thing in one go. Take it nice and slowly. Oh well, one more to do to finish off. First one was difficult because there wasn't much to talk about. Second one seemed easier. I wonder what the third one's going to be like. Displaying business cards alongside those of local tradesmen and service providers in supermarkets and libraries. So you know how it is. You often go into places like shops and you'll see small cards up on the wall from people trying to sell things, sell their services, etc. Hmm. Now, in the second one, advertising in a national accountancy magazine seemed eminently sensible. Cards on supermarket walls? 
do we think that leading company directors, when doing the shopping, are looking as they exit the store to choose a firm of auditors or some tax advisors? Unless this is a very small local firm, I can't really see this as being appropriate. I just don't see other firms doing it, and I think anyone looking at this card might assume you're a very unprofessional amateur organisation. So that's one thing I'm going to say. I do have another problem with small business cards, and that is there's not a lot of space to fully explain what you want to say. Given this is advertising, my fear is there's going to be a lack of clarity and detail and great scope for saying something that could mislead people. Now, all of that will go in my answer, but let's just read through what the rest of it says. Hawk ACCA Associates is what the card would begin with. Well, they're called Hawk, but I thought the question called them Hawk Associates, not Hawk ACCA Associates. Hawk Associates are a firm registered to the ACCA. That does not mean you're allowed to use the letters ACCA in the title of your firm. It's actually against the rules, because some people might assume this is the ACCA's official firm or something like that, and you're not. What Hawk could have done is put Hawk Associates and then put the ACCA's badge on the card with a note saying that Hawk are registered to the association. The problem, of course, is that on a small business card, you've probably not got the space to explain that. And maybe that's why this shortcut is being proposed. But you simply can't do it. It's not your name. For professional accountancy, audit, business consultancy and taxation services. Um, professional is in capitals. Why are they emphasising that so much? Presumably because Hawke are trying to say that there are some firms out there who are not professional, which means Hawke are suggesting bad things about some areas of the accountancy profession, and you cannot do that. It's unprofessional, it's damaging to the reputation of the accountancy industry as a whole. So we'll have to comment on that. Uh, as long as you do offer all of those services as mentioned, the rest of it seems okay. I suppose there is a slight concern that a company might look at this and assume that you can do their accountancy, audit, business consultancy and tax. And of course there are likely to be some ethical threats created by all those other services, especially doing the accountancy and then auditing. But again, this is one of the problems of business cards. There's not enough space to explain that whilst all of these services are offered, the chance of you being able to do all of them for one client at the same time is fairly small. Competitive rates? Competitive with who? PricewaterhouseCoopers? Or a small local firm? Unfortunately, those two words are fairly meaningless and unclear unless you put more detail in. And again, that's the problem with business cards. Money back guarantees. Uh, I have not met too many firms of accountants who ever give money back. That's why they're doing fairly well. And money-back guarantees suggest that in certain situations, the fee will be zero. Well, if the fee is going to change in certain situations, that's contingency fees, surely. It also suggests that if you're willing to give money back in certain situations, you can already foresee that sometimes the quality of your work is not good enough. Which, again, is not a very positive message to put out about your firm or accountants in general. Only four marks available for this one. I think this one is not too bad. Let me show you a plan for my answer.
So, interesting question and quite a unique question. We've not seen much like that over the years. But a nice way to test advertising and fees. And I think the main thing I'd like to point out in there is not so much how we did that question, it's how we do questions in general. Wherever we're looking for marks, we've got to break the problem down as far as we can into individual points. And that often means reading some very small stories very slowly. So there we go. Advertising and fees. Probably the best way to study it is by looking at real examples and an exam question like that.